I'll go very quickly on a bit of the concepts of digital democracy, e-participation, crowdsourcing, so that we all start with some basic concepts on what we're talking about today. So what is digital democracy? As I said, I'm the digital democracy manager, and still my parents and my family have no clue what I'm doing. So digital democracy, what we mean is that it refers to the use of information and communication technology in order to support democratic decision-making, democratic processes, democratic institution. So it's as simple as that. E-democracy e just simply means um, electronic democracy. And it's how to use technology to make our democracy more efficient nowadays. So it relates to online activities between, on the one hand, the governments, and on the other hand, the citizens. So the governments can mean the administrations, the representatives, the politicians, and the citizens, that's us. So I will link now a bit to uh, what I just said between the governments and the citizens to explain the three aspects of e-democracy. So on the one hand, you have the governments, as I said, and on the other hand, you have the citizens. So the first aspect of digital democracy is something that maybe you've heard a lot, um, which is now also very, very trendy, which is e-government. And what do we mean by e-government? It's basically the use of ICT, so information and communication technology, in order to um, uh, improve the public administration through technology. So it's only focused on the government. In the second aspect, we have e-transparency. So it's how the government uses technology and ICT tools to basically open up more to the citizens by publishing in a more transparent way everything it's working on. For example, politicians can publish um, what they're, if they're working on pieces of legislation. They open up more to the citizens, but it goes in this direction, of course. The third aspect, which is the one that we work the most on, is e-participation. And e-participation, as you can see, goes from the citizen also to the government and back also to the citizens. So in the best case scenario, it's when the citizens manage to co-decide a piece of legislation with the government through technological tools. And that's where crowdsourcing is and where other tools of e-participation are. And e-participation can include, according to the United Nations, e-information, which is a bit like e-transparency, but also e-consultation and e-decision making. When I speak about digital democracy, many times now, a lot of political parties in the European Union confuse the concept of digital democracy with direct democracy. I'm from Italy, and we have the Five Star Movement, and our you know, politicians, they're always talking about direct democracy. Um, we want to stress out here that digital democracy is not meant to replace traditional forms of representative democracy but rather to complement them by adding elements of citizen empowerment and more direct participation. So we still believe in elections. We still believe in voting for our representatives who will then go to the government and, you know, work, uh, represent the interests of the citizens. But what we think is lacking at the moment is more direct contact with the people we have represented or ways in which citizens can communicate more to decision makers and try to have a connection. It's not enough to just vote for your representatives. We also have to have more links between citizens and decision makers, especially with young people. That nowadays they're very, um, they don't like traditional politics the way it is. And so they also have this interest in uh, participating in decision making processes. So we have started this research on crowdsourcing. Why? Um, as I said, we're a European association, so we're dealing only with the European level. While here it's more a national event, and uh, there are lots of e-participation experiments going on the national event, but we deal with the EU. And uh, we have started thinking that there is something missing there because there are very, very few uh, e-participation tools. I don't know how many of you know about the European Citizens Initiative, it's basically uh, any citizens of the EU member state can ask the commission to uh, propose a piece of legislation they're interested on. And the way to do that is that first they propose to the commission something they want to uh, start a legislation on, 
Then they create a committee of seven EU member states uh, citizens. And then if the commission says, okay, you can start the initiative, then they have one year to collect one million signatures in the EU with seven member states. And then after one million signatures, of course, hopefully nothing uh, happened until now, but <laughs> the idea was that the commission could initiate a legislative procedure. Only three of them in four years had had success, unfortunately, with around 50 of them which tried to register, not everyone got registered, and then, of course, very few, only three managed to get one million signatures. So it has created a lot of frustration in the EU because this tool is not working. Of course, we are trying to ask the Vice President Timmermans to revise the ECI, but this hasn't happened yet. It doesn't seem to happen. The other one is the online EU public consultation. So it's basically consultation. But the problem with consultation is that sometimes there, the questions are too specific. So citizens like me, uh, I'm not interested, for example, in agriculture or something like that. I can't participate on a consultation because it's too specific and only basically very expert like NGOs or business groups or other stakeholders manage to participate in the consultation. So it's also not a tool for citizens. Then we have petitions to the European Parliament. You can launch a petition, and uh, basically, though, it is on matters which are already existing. So a citizen who wants to propose something new cannot use that tool. Of course, then there are additional ways of e-participation. The Commission has been funding more and more e-participation uh, projects. And, uh, of course, these are all um, other ways, like some DGs are working on their own platforms and MEPs have been working on e-participation. So as we said, we have analyzed that they're limited in quantity and limited in efficiency. And that's why we're trying to find out a way in which we can help citizens voice their opinions more. So we have studied a bit what crowdsourcing is. And just to give a very general definition of what crowdsourcing is because we have also very different ideas of what crowdsourcing is. Crowdsourcing is a way of solving problems and producing things by connecting online with people that otherwise you wouldn't know. Of course in the past crowdsourcing just meant that we would meet up in a room and start brainstorming together on a legislative proposal or something. But nowadays it means mostly online. So online people can collect ideas and then work with decision makers to create a piece of legislation. So just a quick example on uh, what we consider crowdsourcing. In 2008, as you know, there was the economic and financial crisis. In 2010, Iceland realized, the government of Iceland realized that the citizens were very frustrated and very angry at the government. So what did they do? They said, we have to find out a way to connect more to our citizens, to help them understand that they should trust the government and that we are trying to work for them. So they decided to launch a crowdsourcing project. They asked citizens if they would be willing to draft a new constitution for Iceland. And the citizens accepted. They were very happy about the proposal. As you can see, 1,000 citizens created a national forum. And basically, they discussed online through social media as well what kind of values they wanted to see in the new Icelandic constitution. And afterwards, uh, um, 25 of these citizens created a smaller group with the Constitutional Council in order to draft down all of the ideas and make one constitution proposal to be sent to the parliament. And in the third step, there was a non-binding referendum in the whole Iceland with 49% of turnout, so a lot of people, half of the population went to vote if they were for or against the constitution. Unfortunately, afterwards, this, uh, when they sent it to the parliament, this experience sort of failed in the sense that the parliament blocked the whole process and the constitution never went forward. But still, it is not a complete failure but because this is one of the first most important crowdsourcing processes in the EU, which basically uh, set the stepping stone for more crowdsourcing ideas in, in Scandinavian countries and then also in Europe and also worldwide. So we have been identifying 27 cases of crowdsourcing worldwide in our research at ICAS, trying to understand if crowdsourcing actually is a mechanism which can help different <coughs> objectives. So for example, enhance citizens' participation in policymaking. 
ensure full representatives, meaning touching all age groups, gender balance, minorities, etc. Engaging youth, ensuring a learning process, because the good thing about crowdsourcing is that you put citizens to inside policy making and they start learning more also about what politics is and how policy making works. Ensure innovative ideas for policy making based on the wisdom of the crowd. So the wisdom of the crowd is basically when citizens are participating and there are, since we are so many and politicians are so few, it's also very normal that in between us there are some people who are very expert and who are not politicians who would like to give their ideas and they have innovative ideas to, to contribute to um, decision making. And one difficult one is increase political legitimacy and trust. If citizens trust more um, politicians when they can, of course, co-decide more. And the last one is um, keeping the faith in the crowdsourcing method. So as we saw in the Icelandic case, even though it failed, let's say it didn't re reach the objective, if they kept the faith in crowdsourcing as a method to enhance democracy. So this is why, and this is a very, very um, brief graph of um, why we think we should have a crowdsourcing pilot at the EU level. As we said, there's a few problems. 62% of Europeans believe that their voice do not count in the EU. Then we had another survey, 41% of EU citizens want to influence decision-making directly. They don't want to be represented by an NGO. Some, of, some people just want to influence policymakers directly, so we have to fill in that void. Then there are also, so what do we need? We need basically a way to engage those 41% of people and to try to have new tools to, to connect citizens to decision-making. So we have a strategy and basically we would like to um, ask the EU at a certain point to implement a crowdsourcing pilot, a crowdsourcing experience, to see if citizens are willing to, to contribute more to EU legislation and policy making. So, but we have, and I'm going to end it here, almost, we have four questions that we'll be asking to you and hopefully you will think about it through the whole day. We'll be talking about them in the workshops as well. If we were to have a crowdsourcing experience, in which EU policy field could we have it? Because as you have seen on the internet, there are so many trolls, there are so many spams. It's very, very difficult to choose the right policy field. Because if you talk with migration, you can imagine how many emotions are there and would push people to say things that maybe they don't think about too well. But if you talk about something too specific, too long-term, it's too based on rational thinking. and too, So you have to find a sort of balance between emotions and also um, reason. So we have taken, for example, the Eurobarometer in 2016 and asked the citizens, the EU asked the citizens, what are the two most important issues which are the EU is facing at the moment. As you can see, well, after all of the tax in the EU and everything, it's always about immigration, terrorism, the economic situation, because let's not forget what happened also um, in the recent years. But then there's also employment, unemployment, crime, and it goes on like this. So we were thinking maybe we should um, start a crowdsourcing pilot on something citizens are very interested on. But you have to find the right balance, ask the right questions. Then we also went to different uh, youth events and we asked young people, what would you like a crowdsourcing pilot to be on? And we had like a few uh, examples of how many people, we were doing an online polling, they, they basically wrote education. Because of course young people really think about informal education, formal education, Erasmus programs, volunteering abroad and a lot of um, possibilities for young people. So, Young people really think about education, environment, and also in another one, social policy. And then another question after we find out the, the policy field is in which part of EU legislation <coughs> should we start a crowdsourcing? Because crowdsourcing is more about collection of ideas. So should it be in the first phase when people are just like freely giving their ideas and then the EU would choose some of them? Or should it be afterwards when the EU has already some ideas and they ask the crowd which one would you like to apply? So we're still deciding on in which phase this should be in. 
Third is, of course, the technological platform, which will also be discussed in one of the workshops later. If it's 28 EU, EU member states, should we have one technological platform at the EU level, but this risk of not being known in the member states, because as you know, there are a lot of initiatives at the EU level, but then the member states don't know anything about them. Or should it go through national ministries and national platforms and then give the results to the EU on, on the crowdsourcing? So these are still questions that we have. And of course, civil society organizations, through the crowdsourcing experiences that we have seen, civil society organizations are essential for a crowdsourcing project to be successful. Why? Because they're the direct mediators between citizens and governments. And we need civil society organizations to, to also help us give in ideas and afterwards in the member states work on convincing citizens that they can also take part in the project. So if you're interested, if your organization is interested, you can contact Simon, you can contact me, and uh, you can join the project as well. So this is the last slide. So just to sum it up, what I learned while I was doing my research is that EU citizens want uh, more influence on decision making. And my question to you is, do you think citizens would participate if they had more ways to influence policy making? Or do you think that nowadays citizens don't participate in policy making simply because they're not interested in policy making, their lives are too busy? Or do you think it's because some tools are missing? Something else that I learned is, of course, the limits of EU e-participation tools. So I'm asking you as well, do you think crowdsourcing is a good method to involve citizens in EU decision making? And the last one is, of course, the wisdom of the crowd can lead to innovative ideas. And in which policy field would this wisdom be applied and in which entry point? So these are just a few questions. Um, that hopefully also our experts will be debating afterwards in the panels and we will be debating more about them also in the workshops. So thank you very much uh, and I hope this uh, set the playing field. <laughs>